very much uh, for being here. We're very excited uh, to have Dr. Alia Mirali here presenting her work. Uh, Alia is uh, a lecturer in gender studies at Kajaz University and a political organizer of the left. Uh, and she's been a very prominent sort of organizer and activist uh, in uh, Islamabad, working with a number of marginalized and vulnerable communities. Uh, chairing today's session is uh, Dr. Neda Karmani. And I will ask her to take the with me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Umair. Um, I think you already introduced our speaker, so I don't, I don't really have anything extra to add, but we're really excited to have Dr. Ali Amir Ali here presenting this research, which we've been all eagerly waiting to hear about over the last years, and it's an extremely important subject. Um, and I'm just going to hand over to Dr. Amir Ali. Wow, well, thank you. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Omer and Nida, for having me here. I must say, it feels very weird to be addressed as doctor. It's a very recent uh, thing. And this is the first time I'm actually giving a talk on, um, on the thesis. So I'm going to try not to squeeze in um, everything. Um, and yeah, so my talk, the title of the talk today is um, Domestic Workers as Political Subjects. I'm going to split, um, I'm going to try and split this talk into three portions. Um, first, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the project itself. Um, then I will be introducing some of the narratives of work and workplace that, um, that my interlocutors sort of shared with me. And the third and final section of the talk will be uh, about their responses to their experiences. So the project itself is titled, um, domestic workers as political subjects, uh, desire political subjectivation and everyday lives of Islamabad's domestic workers. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary project um, that, so it's based in the, I was based out of the gender studies department at the, the LSE, um, but it uses ethnography, both as method and methodology, um, and basically looks at the everyday lives um, of domestic workers uh, in Islamabad. It focuses on part-time domestic workers, but not exclusively on that. Um, and basically sort of, yeah, traces how their everyday lives, and in three realms in particular, um, that of the gotis, which they were, in which they work, that of the bastis in which they live, um, and then their own lives, their, their personal or intimate lives in their homes in the bastis. And so basically looking at how everyday experiences across these three realms shape them as political subjects. In this talk, as I said before, I'm not going to try and cover everything that's in the thesis. Um, you're welcome to read it. <laughs> I, I would love for people, obviously, every PhD student um, loves for their work to be read. Um, so yeah, there's much more in the thesis than there is going to be in the talk. What I've chosen to focus on is for this particular audience, um, I think are the aspects that I think are important for us to learn about as those pe as people who are based in Pakistan, where domestic service is ubiquitous but also very invisibilized. And I think that all of us also are well. I can speak for myself certainly. Have these conceptions about ourselves as these very benevolent uh, and good employers. So we're not the bad employers, right? We're the good employers of domestic workers. And so we have these, I don't know, conceptions about ourselves as, uh, as being actually benevolent um, in this relationship. And so I'm going to talk more about this as I go along. But so I've selected actually aspects of the PhD that I think speak to um, that, um, that perspective of our own and will hopefully you know, speak back um, to that assumption that we have about ourselves. So to begin, um, why? Why is it important uh, why to understand domestic workers as political subjects? As I said earlier, domestic workers are invisibilized. Um, as workers, first of all, domestic service has only once been a part of the labor force survey. And that too, only when there was ILO pressure. After that, it disappeared from the statistics. Um, so despite the, the legislation that has been passed in recent times about domestic workers, the implementation, any of you who are following that, is close to nil. 
Um, so despite efforts at recognizing domestic service as a dignified form of work, that has not, uh, the implementation of that legislation has not happened. And certainly in society where, as I said earlier, domestic service is ubiquitous. You can actually, I think, almost just divide society into employers of domestic workers and domestic workers themselves. Um, so in humanitarian and developmental contexts and in benevolent employer sort of discourses, they're often presented as being, oh, these poor people who need our help and who need jobs, and actually we're doing them favors by employing them, um, or that you know, they can be, um, you know, they, they can be lifted out of poverty through like poverty reduction programs, etc. So either they appear as victims in need of help or saving, um, you know, or, or as just, you know, victims of torture and abuse. And that's what shows up actually in, in the Pakistani media. What I'm trying to, what I'm arguing and what actually my thesis shows is that um, they are, they're much more than that. They're actually human beings, even if we don't uh, usually consider them as such. They almost never appear as political subjects. Um, that is, as subjects who are actively navigating power structures and relations and who have lives both within and outside the realm um, of domestic service as well as organized politics. Um, and so that's what my sort of, what, what I'm trying to insist on here is also that even the literature that exists on domestic workers compartmentalizes them, right? So either we, we look at them as workers, right? Um, and as workers, we only concentrate on the realm of work. We don't really, we don't go beyond that. Um, and so the picture that you're seeing here, by the way, is of uh, women in a Christian Basti in Islamabad. And so my, my argument is actually they are political subjects. They do participate in political action. Um, but again, their participation is almost always invisibilized. And even within their participation in political action from the political sphere, they are almost always excluded from leadership um, and from active decision making and just, just bust in as bodies. Um, and so, so not really considered political subjects in that sense. Uh, one of my contentions, and, and I'll come to this uh, as I go on when I talk about sort of my context of discovery, is that when I speak about a political subject, I think it's important not to bifurcate, not to have an either or kind of understanding of political subjects or subjectivation, right? So f as I understand it, political subjects, these political subjects in, in particular, have lives both within political action, by which I mean collect collective public mobilizations, as well as outside of political action. So we don't necessarily need to just focus on the everyday micro infra-political or focus exclusively on the collective public political realm. I argue that both of these are a part of the everyday lives of these women and so therefore as political subjects, it is as, as a scholar of political subjectivation, I actually have a duty to follow them in all of these aspects of their lives. Um, so my research question was, I think I've pretty much spoke about it. How do domestic workers, everyday experiences of multiple structural inequalities in and across the sites of the Koti, the Basti and the Basti home, shape them as political subjects? And the, the image that you see here is that of, well, uh, one of my field sites, which was bulldozed, in fact, uh, during field work, and I'll talk about that um, in a little bit. And behind that, you'll see these flats, right? So what initially I was really interested in, and I continue to be interested, but the project afterwards expanded from just this one particular relationship between these women who themselves live in these bustis, but go into kotis or flats or whatever, into elite or middle class homes and return. So my initial question was restricted to, how does this particular everyday back and forth shape them as political subjects. Um, and the fact that my project actually moved away and expanded beyond just how the Koti shapes them as political subjects is, is an interesting story. I'll see if I, uh, if I have time to get to that, I will. So a little bit now about um, how I came, why, you know, why am I studying this? Um, so one of the reasons is that I myself am a Kotiwala. I grew up in Islamabad. Um, I had domestic workers um, in my own home, and I've always had curiosity as a middle class, as someone again who has these conceptions about themselves as being one of the good ones. Who I don't, you know, we didn't exploit our workers, um, but 
just yeah, just curiosity about how that uh, how this relationship has marked those on the other side, and uh, and and knowing that I, no matter sort of how well intentioned I am, I probably have no idea what is going on on the other side. The other um, thing that brought me to this was my experiences as a, as a left organizer. So I've been organizing in the very busties that I did my field work in. These were familiar sites for me because I'd been organizing in them with the left, um, currently with the Awami Workers' Party, but before in, you know, uh, on different platforms. And it, w it came from a recognition that despite our wanting to transform patriarchal structures and to not, you know, to, to expand the scope of political organizing, particularly left political organizing, beyond uh, just men, right? Despite trying to, to, to do things differently and trying to include women, we, we were just not being able to do that. Or we were, you know, it was insufficient. What we were able to do was, in my view, insufficient. And I was, I was wanting to understand why. You know, what, what is it that I'm not able to see as an organizer? Um, and so this was my attempt at sort of putting aside my organizer hat for a change and spending time in the same places where I organized. So it's not that I wasn't organizing, by the way. During field work, I was doing both. I was continuing to organize and I was also a researcher. And this was not an easy relationship. Um, and there's, yeah, <laughs> I've written actually a paper about that because it was so turbulent. Um, and generated so much. It was both turbulent and productive. Um, but yeah, I won't, I won't get into that today, but uh, that's, that's definitely something we can talk more about um, in the Q&A as well, if you would like. Um, so yeah, I was, I was curious to understand um, why we are not really able to integrate working class women into our organizational fold and also to center them. So these women in these busties, as I showed you in the earlier picture, it's not that they weren't participating in political action, but this was um, my attempt at centering those who had always been on the peripheries, both of politics as well as, our, uh, as, well as scholarship. So how I went about doing this? Um, as I introduced earlier, it was an ethnographic project. Um, and as we all know, fieldwork is basically about, you know, being part of, of that space, being part of their everyday lives. Uh, I wasn't living in the Bastis myself, and I didn't pretend to be a Bastiwala either. Um, um, and, and so the Bastis were not, so I think these, we, again, the methodology is so important that I feel, find it difficult to talk about it in these like small slivers, because it's actually one of the things that I think is the most uh, undervalued and under, understood, actually, under understood um, things about, you know, social science research. Um, but so my understanding was that, okay, these bastis are not just places where we go and just collect data and come back. These are places where the knowledge that I'm presenting to you is being produced. Um, and ethnography is truly, like, if you, you know, if any of you are anthropologists, I'm, I'm, well, I'm sitting next to some as well, I know, but I don't know how many of you are also uh, anthropologists, but if you do, do ethnography well, it literally has the potential to, to completely disrupt and disturb anything that you actually went in with. Um, so that also uh, happened to me. Um, and and one, of, one of the ways that that disruption uh, manifested was, as I shared earlier, earlier my interest as, you know, a good, in well-intentioned middle-class person was to understand how uh, their experiences of inequality in the Koti shame them as political subjects. It is through the ethnographic experience and through the ethnographic process that I came to know that that's just one aspect of their lives. I may, through because of my middle-class guilt, think, oh my God, this, this shapes everything, right? That this must be defining or definitive. Uh, of their political subjectivities, but um, it was the ethnographic process that led me to understand that, hey, their lives don't revolve around us. Yeah? We, it's not that class and, and domestic service and those relationships don't matter, but we are not the center of their worlds, that their worlds consist of lots of other things, including what the image that you see right now, which is the everyday fact of 
forced eviction, so their relationships with the state, as well as their personal and intimate lives. All of these matter, it's not just us. So I'm gonna move now to narratives. Um, and you know, there, was, there were lots, of course, mm, that were shared. <clears throat> and so in terms of how, and obviously I'm going to share you know, those narratives that were sort of paradigmatic, right? That almost, that many, many, many people said to me. Majburi, as you all know, um, is, well, I'm translating it to compulsion. There are probably other, other ways to translate this. I translate that to compulsion. And almost everyone I spoke to said, we, would, we wouldn't be doing this agar majburi na hoti. So majburi is what brings these subjects into domestic service in the first place. Majburi is primarily economic, as the term was used. Um, but so kam majburi karwati, but majburi was also not just limited to the economic. So for example, safed poshi, right? So have, these are you know, working class people living in Bastis who have networks in the villages, who have you know, migrated you know, either second, third, fourth generation even, but have connections to, to their villages where it's important for them to present themselves as having done something for themselves, right? as having done well economically. Um, so that often puts them into debt. So the, the uh, imperative of repaying loans uh, is huge. Almost everyone I met was indebted um, to multiple people for multiple things. And one of the things that puts them into debt is these unforeseen events, like majburi ban jati hai, right? Ke kisi bhi vakt, it can happen at any time, kisi ka accident ho gaya, kisi ki fought ki ho gayi, someone got laid off from work. So all of these things like majburis are, are, are constantly being produced in everyday life. And so therefore domestic service is just um, yeah, uh, it is it, unlike sort of our views of like, oh, you know, we're, we're helping them out. No, literally, if the people uh, who work for us uh, didn't have to be there, they would not, irrespective of how nice we think we are to them. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just, just uh, this, this will just give you a broad overview of how domestic workers were describing um, their experiences of work and workplace. So one ma major thing was very, very little pay. I mean, 3,000 rupees in this day and age, and that was actually the average for part-time um, task-based work. Uh, and full-time live-in work is, is you know, 20 to 25,000. I mean, these days you, you, you know what the value of that money is, and it's quite, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll save the, uh, the, the scathing bits for their own um, quotes, but I mean, it's a, bit, it's a bit fresh when people who themselves earn lakhs and lakhs of rupees say, oh, you know, sorry, we can't raise your, um, your wages by another 5,000. Um, that's something that doesn't go unnoticed um, by domestic workers, yeah. So other common features included being overworked, uh, being given separate utensils, which I'm going to talk about um, shortly, being asked to do extra tasks uh, outside the agreed parameters of the job, being treated with suspicion or accused of stealing, little or no care, empathy, recognition, or appreciation of their work by employers. And what emerged from these experiences was, was many things, but a, a very, very clear distinction of us and them, very clear perception sense of, of class, right? Of class and of class, a very sharp class critique. Um, the ways in which that class critique was expressed was both through this um, discourse or the use of the terms of what I call conceptual vocabularies of Amir Log versus Gharib Log, but a lot of it actually, a lot of the class critique was expressed in non-class terms and specifically through the deployment of religious discourse. That's something that, again, is, is a whole, it has a whole place in the thesis. It doesn't have uh, much of a place in this talk, but if you're interested, we can obviously talk a lot more about it. Um, but I found it really interesting that some of the sharpest um, forms of class critique were, were happening through the deployment of religious uh, discourse, um, rather than just a clear-cut class uh, discourse. One of the 
again, one of the, the, the phrases that sort of jumped out at me in particular was this one. Because one of the reasons it jumped out at me was because I had never heard it before. I had never knew that this is, that nafrat is something that joke, you know, employers of domestic workers ke saath mansoob ki jati hai. And, and it was a shock to me also because I never thought, hey, I don't, you know, have any nafrat for my domestic workers. But, but the fact that this came out as a paradigmatic phrase really tells us something. And usually referred first and foremost to the practice of separating utensils. Um, you know, ke plate alag karna, bartan alag karna, glass alag karna. Um, but, and this is not only associated with Christian domestic workers. Hamara aksari khayal hota hai ki this is something that we only practice with Christians. But there's that Ikra, uh, who I actually met in Lahore, she's not, she didn't work here, but I met her in Lahore. Um, 95, she says that 95 out of 100 employers separate their utensils from those used by their workers. So this is a Muslim domestic worker um, who is, um, you know, who's saying this. What these women have to say themselves about it is in front of you. It's, it's, one, of the, it's one of the things, this sort of form, these forms of untouchability uh, is one of the things that was most painful and that was most sort of that was sharpest um, in sort of in their in their narratives about uh, about their employers, right? So as Maria says, the same people who cook your food for you, the same hands that feed you, are the ones that you're shunning as dirty. How does that make any sense, right? Um, then there's uh, the Mehrabadi group discussion, which is describing how you know this this again this feeling of oh that it's okay to just give discarded food, clothes, and to actually expect domestic workers to be grateful for that, right? And for domestic workers to not even be able to express their, as she's saying, disdain, uh, like the, the, the feeling of like humiliation, right? At, at not just being given discarded or chuta things, but also having to appear grateful about it on top of that. Um, this, I think, for me, one of the main major things that this thesis in general has thrown up is in our, uh, in the Pakistani context, our lack of attentiveness to caste. For some reason, I think maybe it's because we as Pakistanis think that caste is a Hindu problem and so we don't have to deal with it, it doesn't exist here. It very much exists. Um, my thesis was, did not, I didn't start out focusing on caste, but it's, it's definitely something that I've come out thinking, wow, we really need to, a focus on this. Um, so, and, and by caste, I'm, I'm not assuming that caste in Pakistan just exists and that we should just use the same conceptual categories and understanding of caste as it exists in Indian scholarship, but there's a, you know, there, there's a big case to be made that, you know, that current uh, studies of inequality um, really need to center caste and we need a much deeper conceptual understanding of what caste in Pakistan means. Um, and how it's showing up in, you know, in the social fabric. The last quote in this is just, I mean, it was one of the, yeah, it was one of those moments in field work where, where you're just like, you know, you basically, I was just drowning in shame. Um, because if you, I'll read it for you. People often ask us, this is Farah from the G11 Basti who's saying, people often ask us what we eat. We're not cows that eat grass. We also eat what you eat, if you've ever bothered looking. I've thought many times in my heart that I'd like to ask them sometime. What do you eat? Have any of you ever given us an interview? So she's being diplomatic here, yeah? By like making it appear as if she's talking about ask them sometime. I see her as directly asking me. I don't, I think it was a, a, a veiled, um, you know, way of saying to a koti wala's face, I mean, what, why, you know, the, the, of basically sort of resisting uh, the very sort of clearly skewed power dynamics between amir lo, karib lo, koti wala's and basti wala's and between researcher and researched, all of them. The other phrase that really stood out for me in terms of how people described, how these, these subjects described their experiences was mujhe apni ka pata hai. I'm going to read these um, 
share these quotes with you. Uh, before that, I'm going to introduce who this, uh, who Roshni is. By the way, the, the images, unless you know specified, the images are not directly from my field work. Um, I chose not to not to take photographs of primary in interlocutors to ensure co confidentiality and anonymity. Um, and I know that that pictures and photography are such a sensitive thing for at least for the, in the spaces and for the subjects that I was working with that only in instances where I know it's okay with them have I actually sort of shared them. So the spaces, the busty spaces, um, and collective gatherings I've shared. But for instance, like images like this, for instance, you'll see the photo credits are, are given below. Um, so Roshni, who is basically someone, uh, a young woman, uh, unmarried in her 30s, who actually had a very good employment relationship. So she, she was, yeah, she never had any complaints she, about, about her employers and always, always described her. She had one very long-term employment relationship. And so this is her saying, uh, I'd eat in the kitchen, even if it meant I had to wait to eat until all the male staff had left the kitchen to go in. No matter how much someone lifts you up, koi aapko kitna bhi kyun na somewhere inside this feeling nags at you that I am a mulazim. It doesn't feel right. This thought remains stuck here and she's pointing to her head. Maybe it doesn't happen to others, but it's definitely there for me. So later in the same interview, I asked Roshni, it was more than an interview, it was just a conversation spread over, I don't know, three and a half, four hours. We were outdoors in a park, nowhere else, nobody listening outside of the employer space in completely sort of neutral spaces, which was, it was just an amazing, um, it was an amazing experience. I don't think I'll ever forget it. I, at this particular moment, I'm asking Roshni, so, because Roshni was also always sort of torn between being at work and then wanting and needing to take care of her, of her ailing mother back in her hometown. So I had asked her, so once your mother passes um, and, you know, and, and you don't, you know, and at this point her employers had actually moved away, so she was not working uh, at the employer's place currently. She said to me, um, so I asked her, so what, what will you do, what do you want to do once, once your mother passes, um, because once the imperative of taking care of your mother is gone? She says, how can I move elsewhere out of my hometown? To venture beyond that is futile. Something that isn't in your reach, that hasn't been made for you, and you start desiring it, that is foolish. It would simply be putting yourself through torture. Now this is a, this is a very, it's a very loaded um, um, set of sentences, right? It's saying so much about, and again, like what, what this says about how all of these different forms of exploitation do to these subjects as desiring subjects um, is, again, it's something that has a place in my thesis. I just want to name it here. I'm not going to be able to talk about it much. Um, there's much more to say. I, I feel like I'm sort of jumping very quickly from things that are very, um, yeah, that are very core, that are very deep, that are also very very full of pain um, and that are uh, such important parts of the lives and the experiences of my interlocutors, but you know, time and the, the structure of the academy is going to make me ruthlessly jump to, um, to, well, to another part of this talk, which tries to give you glimpses of how the kinds of experiences that I've, I've shared with you so far um, how these domestic workers or how these subjects are responding to them. Um, and in these responses, the first aspect that I want to share with you is, again, a phrase which claims, this is a, you know, it's a big claim, uh, which obviously <laughs> means that they don't think they're otherwise considered human. So. Uh, to, to, to stake the claim that, yes, we are human too, um, is also a, a call for inclusion, um, for equality in particular ways, and we can talk more about what I mean by equality. Um, and it's also, I mean, for me, it was also interesting, right, because there's a whole discourse in, you know, in decolonial literature about, like, the human and, 
you know, the ideas that, oh, you know, the, the, even the concept of the human is this sort of universalizing, totalizing um, concept, like Walter Mignolo and all of these folks have this like critique, right, of, of the human and are generally quite, um, yeah, dismissive of it. And, and I'm saying that it's not just because this is in vernacular that Hambi and Sanhe is important. It's also because the ways that, that these subjects were using in San was also universal, right? So it's not all universals are bad. In fact, this, the insan, the universal insan that, that these workers are actually claiming to be and creating uh, through their own discourse uh, is one that is actually necessary, a necessary part of their response to and their resistance to class, caste, and gender depression. So the idea that, oh, you know, all of these universals are, are something that we need to get away from, I, I think that story needs to be complicated a little bit. Coming back to what, how they're using these, um, this particular phrase, they earn, so Parveen is pointing to one particular aspect, right? So Parveen says they earn well over three lakhs, yet they claim that, they're paying, that paying us 2,500 is too much for them. It makes me angry. They don't think that this person is human too. Who has come to fulfill needs of their own. And Akhir Hambi Insane. So for Parveen, it is the it's the, it's the hypocrisy of the rich uh, and of you know not considering um, not considering workers, uh, human beings who have homes to run, who have kids to feed, um, and who are sort of autonomous beings who, like the employers themselves, are working hard. Uh, as, as a means to live a dignified life. Uh, Nazia from, and uh, all of these names, by the way, are sort of, they've been changed <laughs> from their original. Hum bhi insaan hai, humara bhi to dil hai, says Nazia. When they give us juta, khana, ya kapre, rona bhi aata hai, aur ghussa bhi. So here, I think the reason why this is important is because what Nazia is pointing to is hamara bhi to dil hai. So being human is not just about sort of being one's material conditions or being paid a fair wage. It's also saying, look, the, the humiliation that, that we feel, right? That the fact that we actually are beings who feel things. So when you give us juta khana, we actually feel something, whether whether you notice or not. And that's actually is quite similar to what Maria is saying. If you so Maria, the third and last quote that I've put here is between Maria and her baji. Now Maria and her baji, Maria was actually a live-in worker, unlike most of the workers that I had spent time with. And Maria and her baji had quite an interesting relationship because by the end of the employment relationship, Maria was being very, also because she knew it was going to end soon, because she was going to get married and she was going to leave the job. So as she got closer and closer to leaving the job, she became more and more, um, let's just say, confrontational with her baji. And so this is a particular exchange between Maria and her baji towards the end of Maria's employment relationship where Maria has been taken along with the employer's family to some very long drive to, to the employer's village. So they had to drive like 12 hours one way and 12 hours back. So it's the next morning, uh, the next evening, and Maria's baji is also, uh, um, she, she's also working, um, she's also employed in the state bank. So she had to leave the very next day early in the morning. So when the baji comes back home, she says, they've gotten into this tiff. And Maria's baji says, I leave at 7 a.m. and I return home at 7 p.m. Kya main san nahi Am I not human? And Maria says, Cha, kya main san nahi Am I not human who works from 7 a.m. till 3 a.m. in the night? You at least got some sleep after we got back. What about me? Actually, you know what? You're right. It's only you people who are human. How can I be human? If I were human, I would be affected by the exhaustion. But since I'm not, what difference would it make to me? So a very clear sort of one of the, 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 the aspects of the claim to being human that is standing out here is the capacity to, to be affected. Um, and claiming that, and okay. Same Maria, a third quote from her brings out a third and last aspect of uh, this, this claim to being human. She says, I don't, and she's saying, uh, now, now this is Maria after she's gotten married, yeah. She says, 
And I asked her, so what's, what's changed? How are things now? She says, I don't think my life has changed much since I got married. By the way, she was really excited about getting married as well before, before she actually got married. Before marriage, I was working and living in the Kotis. When my brothers would visit me there, I would wish that they'd take me out somewhere. Maybe in Sanhu, I am human too. I feel like getting out sometimes. Now that I'm married, I wait in the hope that my husband will take me out. That's all that's changed. So, yeah, the fact that it's not just, so the claim to being human is not just something that was directed towards employers, ya amir log, ya koti wale. It's also being invoked in the context of patriarchy and of patriarchal uh, relations. Um, and yeah, so, so that's also another, another sort of thing that I was really, I, I, I guess I want to point out that it's, you know, it's not, the people's lives are, and these, these women's lives are an amalgamation of all of these different sort of layers and these different forms of, uh, of oppression. And so just looking at one without the rest is, feels, um, yeah, it feels wrong. <laughs> Um, so, just to conclude this particular segment, Hambi and Sanhe is a demand to be recognized as autonomous, dignified, laboring beings, and as effective beings with the capacity to affect and be affected. Crucially, the use of this term claims an entitlement to dignity, to being treated respectfully, and to be recognized as autonomous beings with lives, needs, and desires of their own. And finally, the last aspect of their responses uh, to these relations of exploitation and indignity, which they clearly sort of, despite, oh, one thing that I, I forgot to mention, and, and if any of my interlocutors were in this room, they would have stopped me and probably asked me to, to remind all of you, because this is something that they would say right at the start whenever I'd ask them about their employment experiences. They were like, they can't see koti wale just like say, uh, some are good, some are bad. So they would always start with this qualification. It was never like, oh, all employers are bad, or, or all employers are good. They'd be like, look, just like all unglis are different, all employers are also different. Some are good, some are bad. Um, so um, having said that, um, the vast majority of them did not have good employment experiences. And, um, and yeah, the, but, but the sort of collective, one of the ways in which those, those relationships of, exploitment, uh, of exploitation and indignity were being responded to was through what, what James Scott would say, weapons of the weak. Um, and sort of I have, like, again, one of my chapters describes all of those ways, right? Um, those, just to be very quick, uh, those include speaking about people behind their backs, um, you know, sort of saying uh, silence was actually a really important um, strategy that was used. And sometimes, as we've seen earlier, workers are also willing to and, and do confront employers straight on. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of different things that, there's a lot of factors that contribute to how and when a worker uh, decides to openly confront an employer. It's not that it never happens, it does happen, but the conditions under which that happens are, are complicated. And so we can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, but yeah, so in terms of sort of open resistance uh, to employers, there was both open resistance as well as much more sort of, you know, coveted um, behind the scenes and as sort of James Scott would say, you know, the weapons of the week and sort of the hidden transcripts are what actually revealed what those, um, what those weapons are. But they include mimicking, they include, um, you know, making fun of them behind their backs. Uh, they include just humoring them, right? So appearing um, deferential, but actually having a completely different perception in their heads. The bits that I want to draw your attention to right at the end is that, as I said earlier, domestic workers and working class women living in Pakistan's Bastis are not considered political subjects, but they regularly particip participate in political action. 
This is a picture of Muslim women. They're, so it's not just Christian, poor Christian women who participate. These, this is a group of Muslim women. The very, vast majority of them are domestic workers. They are organizing a demonstration against against the forced evictions of the G11 Basti that I showed you earlier. And they're also uh, resisting uh, Mengai, right? And, um, and rise in prices. So these are people who participate, who also participate in political action. So G the G11 Basti, which I spoke to you about earlier, which was being in, which as it was being demolished, um, it was the women of that Basti who were the most courageous, who were insistent upon staying and not being relocated, and who had some of the most sophisticated strategies to set back the CDA. The men, after a day or two, were saying, had said, hands up, let's go, let's move, we can't beat them, let's just do it. The women said, no, we're gonna stay, and we're gonna stay for as long as we possibly can. So lots of other, by the way, it is those women, actually, who, went and did a gerao of a police van jahapar so we were we uh, we the awp were involved in helping them resist that uh, the, the those evictions and in that process some of our workers got stuffed into a police van by the police obviously and we were being taken to the thana but these the women of the basti came and surrounded the um, the police van and basically freed all of the us middle class people who had come to help them right um, so what has come out is that you know in the in the process of political organizing there is a cross-class mutual broadening of the we as well right it's it's it has uh, it it was something that that you know that expanded that that horizon for them as well as for us um, and one of the other lessons that for me as a political organizer was a reminder that you know it's only when we are in consistent, productive, respectful, and mutual relationship with people that some kind of bond is made. You know, this idea of solidarity politics, statement like the you know, just, just issuing statements and taking positions is not a politics of transformation, at least. That's that's I think it might be a politics of appeasement, it's not a politics of transformation. What this process showed me or reminded me of was the importance of, of being in relationship and being in consistent and mutual relationship. And finally, the idea I was also very curious about, again, as an organizer, um, what is it that brings people to protest? So why do those who join protests join them? And why do those who don't join not join? And so one of the, the answers that I got was, well, sometimes people join not because they think the world is going to change, or not because they think, but because it's fun. If, if it's fun. If it's boring, then it's like, OK. Uh, then it's usually some kind of majburi, right? Ke bhi mai baap ne keh diya, ya chalo khane ki lalaj de di, ya aap kisi, you know, again, it, patronage relationships, right? Um, all of these things uh, are usually, or material compulsions, all of these things are the usual factors for um, having to participate in sort of political demonstrations, but the AWP simply just, A, doesn't do politics like that, uh, and doesn't, neither has the ability or the willingness uh, to do that kind of patronage-based, um, to that kind of patron-based politics, and so, what I understood about when they participate is A, they were having fun with us. B, it's an avenue for togetherness. So it is through these protests that these women from Alipur Farage and those women from the G11 Basti and the women from France Colony and all of these women who, who were, are otherwise completely separated, for the first time were actually in a space where they're hearing support from other women like them and being sharing space with them and realizing that it's that 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 we're not alone um, and reciprocity and i say the la that's the last aspect right that even with sort of progressive um organizations like the awp um, obviously there's a power relationship there as well right participating in in these protests for you know for many of these women was a way of giving back 
It was saying, look, we, this is what we can do, right? Because we have benefited from this politics, us showing up in these protests is, uh, is our way of giving back to the same forces that have helped us in our time of need. So the importance, right, of, of being able to reciprocate Majburi is also something that is not just compulsion. There's choice, there's agency in navigating the compulsion of Majburi, right? It's motaji, which is dependence, which is the most painful thing. Um, and which is distinguished, which was very, there was a clear distinction in their narratives between Mohtaji and Majburi. And it is Mohtaji that is the most sharply painful thing. Majburi was described as the structural conditions that compel people to make particular choices, choices that they wouldn't otherwise make if circumstances were not the way they were, but it's still an agentic choice, right? But when Jabab Mohtaj ho jate, that aspect of being able to choose, even in difficult circumstances, just sort of, it, you know, you lose that. And so participating in political action was a way of not being mortage, not just being a receiver, but also giving back um, to the same, to, to the very people who they feel have supported them in their time of need. I'm gonna stop there because my one minute was over more than one minute. <laughs> so thank you.